we, wherever you are, stand for the reading of the word. We're going to go to 2 Chronicles 7 and 12 through 14. And the word of the Lord says, Then the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. He said, When I shut up heaven and there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people, if my people who were called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. He said, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sins and I will heal their land. And my title this morning or this evening is Awaken Me. God, in the name of Jesus, I pray that the mighty hand of God would work through this message. Only you know God who's going to listen. The average congregation that was going to originally listen is no longer the average congregation because now this message is going to go out into the world wide web and I don't know how many people will hear it. But I ask you today, God, to allow those who need to hear it, let them hear it. Let them have ears to eat, hear, hearts to perceive, and eyes to see what the Spirit is saying to the Lord through this word. In Jesus' mighty name. God bless you all. You may be seated. My title is Awaken Me. Most of us have a theory about what's happening right now in, the, in our world regarding this invisible enemy we're all facing. I've heard so many theories, and you could probably share yours. I wish we were together so we could talk about it, about, about the origin of COVID-19. Like it's, a, it's possibly biological warfare. And I can honestly see where that could definitely seem to be a reality from one of our nation's enemies. You know, possibly the, the, the multi-billionaire and philanthropist George Soros, who has desired to bring America down for a very long time. Or maybe it originated in Russia with the power-hungry Putin. Or, I mean, any of these could be possible. Or maybe in China's Jinping. After all, it did start in China. Or maybe Iran's Rouhani. He's always shouting and declaring death to America. But I recently heard a TED Talk, and this was so interesting to me, by Bill Gates. And he said that we should not fear nuclear he said, but we should fear a pandemic. Hmm. I'm thinking, Bill Gates, how did you know that? So, or it could be, I've heard and, and no doubt, it could be a political ploy to squash the reelection of our current president, President Trump, by bottoming out the economy and sending us into a recession. I've also heard that this could be a social experiment. And that's very interesting, just to see how Americans will res respond psychologically and socially to what they're leading us to do because of this virus. It all, sa it all sounds so sinister to me that this virus targets the elderly and the weak. Seems as though they're trying to get rid of those who are a drain on the the system. All of these theories can, could possibly be likely for what's transpiring in our world right now. Do you remember the movie? It's old, 1997. It was titled Conspiracy Theory with uh, Mel Gibson and Julia Roberts. And he was an obsessive, compulsive New York City taxicab driver who was extremely paranoid. He was outspoken towards the government publicly. And he also had a conspiracy theory about everything from aliens to political assassinations. It sounds a little bit like us, doesn't it? But today, I want to present a theory to you that you may not have considered. Because every day, I don't care, you can grab your phone at any time of the day, we're inundated constantly with negative and gloom and doom media about this situation. So it makes it very hard for us to be able to look at it 
in, and, and to see what is actually going on. The situation definitely has an appearance of biological warfare or a political scheme or a social experiment. But I propose to us today that we are engaged in a spiritual battle. About 11 years ago, <clears throat> I was hospitalized for over a month <clears throat> because of an infection that I acquired during uh, surgery. The fluid from the liver, fist, uh, liver cysts that were drained got trapped in my abdomen and I became deathly ill. And the worst part about the whole thing was the doctors, they had no answers for me. My husband literally almost got kicked out of the hospital for voicing his frustrations. Every day, he watched me get worse and worse and more withdrawn. And in the middle of our trial, we got a phone call from a prophet of the Lord. And he didn't know what was going on. And this is what he said. You're in a spiritual battle, but you're fighting this in the flesh. When we told him what was going on, he says, the doctors won't be able to help you. God is your only answer. And from that moment forward, I promise you, I, I, something snapped. It all made sense in my mind. I was so inundated with the physical ailments and, and thinking that these doctors could help me in the situation. I stopped. We stopped asking the doctors and we surrendered it completely to God. The word just snapped me into reality and helped me to look through spiritual lenses rather than natural lenses. And, and that's my desire today, that you would begin to look at this situation through spiritual lenses and not natural lenses. So many of us have been seeking answers Every time the president comes on, we want to hear what he's got to say. And Dr. Fauci with the CDC and the local governor. Oh, the governor's going to be on at three. And the stock market. Oh, my goodness, what's the stock market doing? Or, oh, did they come up with the right vaccination yet? Or, or are we going to get a large enough stimulus check? Or are we going to be able to apply and, and, and qualify for an SBA loan and every other avenue? But none of these avenues are our answer to this dilemma. God is our only answer and he needs to awaken us. Say that to yourself. God, awaken me. Awaken me. Let me come alive spiritually and not be saturated by the negativity coming in my eyes and in my ears and into my heart. Let me see this through spiritual lenses. At the beginning of March, when we could still didn't have to social distance and we could still hug and eat with someone and, and greet each other. We were having lunch, my husband and I, with, uh, with a lady from the church. And she asked this question to me. She said, when do you think God is going to have enough? And obviously she was asking rhetorically because I knew and she knew that I didn't have the answer to such a weighty question. But I can't Imagine, I really can't imagine this evil continuing for much longer without God's intervention. And I have a question. Could this be God's intervention? After all, we're in a spiritual battle and God is trying to get our attention. In the days of Noah, the Bible says in Genesis 6 and 5, and God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. I honestly can't imagine things being worse then than they are in our world today. And I want to share just a few things that, a few horrific evils in my estimation, and I think in yours too, that are going on in our world today. Number one, human trafficking is an epidemic. There are over 27 million people who are enslaved by human traffickers. And 2.5 million people, are, are, they fall prey annually. Those who are trafficked, they're treated as disposable. 
And they, they are, they're bought and sold like possessions. And then, this, this is so disheartening to me, if that's not bad enough, child pornography and sexual abuse of children. In my humble estimation, this is the most heinous crime there is. And it's the most unnatural, it's the most perverse and filthy thing happening in our world today. Children are completely vulnerable to adults. They don't expect adults to be their enemy. They expect adults to be their advocate. And in this situation, adults in certain instances are not their advocate. I can't even imagine, it makes me sick, what it does to a holy God to have to witness this travesty in the earth. And then there's the transgender and homosexual revolution that's happening. It has gained so much momentum in the last, in recent years. I want to share something that I, I recently read that just blew my mind. There are drag queens reading to children in public libraries. Look, they're reading to our kids. It's not princesses anymore or it's not a clown, or it's not a, 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 you know, a, a, an action figure, but drag queens. And this was started, I'll, I'll tell you how it started to show you the, the uh, motive, if you will, behind it. In 2015, of all places, San Francisco, by a woman named Michelle T. She's an author, a poet, and she's a literary organizer. Her works explore queer culture, feminism, sex works, if that's not enough, and other topics. Her goals, listen to her goals, they are to inspire a love of reading. I wish we would have stopped there. While teaching deeper lessons on diversity, self-love, and an appreciation of others. You tell me what you feel her motives are. I can't judge her motives, but it seems pretty obvious. They actually have a website, and I pulled it up to be able to look at the pictures. It's called dragqueenstoryhour.org. And when I Googled it, because I am 30 minutes from New Orleans, Drag Queen Story Hour New Orleans came up. So it's near, and it's probably just as near you as it is me. Number four, our children are being indoctrinated truly in perversity in public schools during their sex edu education class. It, sometimes we don't even know what's happening and the, the, the infiltration to get to that next level. Our children, those who are vulnerable, the LGBTQ groups and those who support abortion, they're attempting to indoctrinate them with their bias. And then there's that horrific situation that's been going on for 47 years and counting, where over 60 million unborn babies have been murdered because they claim a woman has a right to choose. That's over 3,000 babies killed a day, and it's happening in our own backyard. Just Google. Planned Parenthood, and there's one within, with not far from you. I did that too. I Googled it, and it's right in the city of New Orleans. And their blood, if the innocent blood of Abel cried out to the ground, what must six, over 60 million innocent victims' blood be doing this day? It's crying out to the ground to God. These unfathomable things are actually happening in our world as we speak. And this is, what, this is what the church is up against today and why we must be stronger, not weaker than ever before. We are our world's only hope. That's why it's important. I really do believe with everything in me, this was the will of God 
because he wanted to break us out of these four walls. We had gotten so accustomed to being in these four walls and clustering with those of like mind and, and those that we, we think alike and we, we live the same way and, and we really weren't, weren't going over the wall and into our neighborhoods, but right now we're forced to do it. And Jesus said certain words to us. He said, occupy until I come. And that's what we're to do right now. We're to occupy, not stay cloistered in the building and, and, and preach to one another and lay hands on each other and, and jump and shout with each other. We need to get out and occupy until he comes. These evils, truly, that are happening, they make me so angry with, a, with, a, with this, um, I can't think of the word, but this self-righteous indignation. It makes me want to lash out at people who are hurting these innocent people. I can't even imagine being, uh, being sex trafficked or human trafficked or abused as a child. So it makes me want to reach, to lash out at them. But we must recall the words of the Apostle Paul. They're very hard to hear. But 1 Corinthians 6 and 11, he said, and such were some of you. When I want to get righteous, self-righteous and point the finger and judge, but you were washed by the grace of God and you were sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. We are all just as sinful in the eyes of God as, as these people that I just mentioned to you and he extended mercy and great mercy and grace to us and at a time we didn't deserve it and and so we must do the same to them no matter who they are no matter what they're doing no matter what they look like the power of God and his salvation is their only hope truly it is our world's only hope so many of us I don't know about you, but I've found great peace in this season. It's slowed down. It's a slower pace of life. And, and hopefully, you're enjoying your family more. Right now, I'm socially distant from my, my parents and my mother-in-law and my sister and my family and obviously the church. And that's, that's disheartening. But I've been able to sit back and breathe and and muse a whole lot more. But even while we're doing this, we must never forget that we, the church, are the called and commissioned ones who have been left in this earth to make a difference. Even though we're quarantined and we can't come together in this church building, we are still commanded to do the work of God now more than ever before. You know why? Because the world needs it now more than ever before. They're ripe right now. They're, they're, they're desperate. They don't know the answers as we know. They don't have the peace that you and I have. So how are you util utilizing your valuable time right now? Are you making the most of it? What will you have to show for this time that we've been given? I want you to think about all the positive things, if, if I could say that, uh, about COVID and what it's done for the church since this has happened. It has totally, as I said, gotten us out of the four walls. It has forced us into the field. It truly has. You know, I, I know for us, we're always running in and out, in and out the, the, the house, in and out of the driveway, to and fro. We don't have time for anyone, but the Lord has made us slow down and, and, and be more aware of what's going on around us. Number two, we have been bombarding the airwaves. The enemy is the prince and power of the airwaves, but this is awesome because we are bombarding the airwaves with the Lord's message. I want you to give him a hand clap because that is powerful. He's got a way of doing things. He's a great orchestrator. Think about it. So many more people are listening to our messages than they were just a couple of weeks ago. 
Number three, we're actually doing random acts of kindness. We have more time to really think about doing something kind for someone as well as our neighbors. I, there's so many stories that's been shared with us about that. And number four, we have more time to engage with our neighbors. We have lived next to one of our neighbors for 18 years, Joe and Dale, and we give them a half a wave as we put it in reverse and fly out the back of the, the driveway and come back in and give them a wave. How you doing, neighbor? We have talked more to our neighbors in this time than ever. I've been able to share a Bible study with her. I was able to give her a devotion. I was able to help her with her, her grandson to where to get a Bible. I was able, we were able to do all these things. She had questions that were burning in her heart. Normally, we'd have had to go. We've got to run to church. We've got to run here. We've got to go there. But we are still right now. God is doing amazing things through this. Number five, we have more Focused time and less distracted time for prayer, for truly focused prayer and deeper reading of the word. How many times when, when life was hectic, you say your prayers and, and you're like thinking a thousand things you have to do and you're reading the Bible, but you're not really reading, you're checking the box. But now he's got our attention because life is a whole lot less hectic. And now he's urging us to step up our game. I think you'll agree with me. I think you will, and, and I pray that you will, that the church in these recent years has become very complacent and distracted. The lore of this world, the saturation of entertainment, it's all over, it saturates us, and our financial security, it's blinded our eyes, spiritualized it's deafened our spiritual ears and it's caused our hearts to become hardened and as you can clearly see much of these distractions have been removed and he's given us spa a space of time to wake up from our slumber and to re-engage it is time whoever you are and wherever you are whoever hears this word I pray that it would settle in your heart that you would hear God speaking and not see me or hear me, but that the word of God would pierce into your heart like a double-edged sword. We are the chosen generation that has been left in this world for the perilous times of these last days. What will you do? How will you respond to this challenge? This is a great challenge, but we have to identify who we are. We're not just the average church on the corner, or we don't just attend the church because it's near our house, or we don't, we're just don't come to check a box. We are the called out ones. We are the church. We've been left in this earth to get the world rapture ready. Somebody got us ready. We have got to get someone We've got to reach out and we've got to get them ready for the rapture. Second Chronicles 7, 12 and, and, and 14 was originally spoken um, in response to Solomon's prayer. It's such a beautiful, beautiful text. And, and it's so fitting, just as fitting for us today as it was for them, especially to a generation that has sinned against God and who are now dealing with the fallout. People, we're dealing with the fallout of our sin. And you know what that fallout is? That is the mercy of Almighty God. He's given us a space and time to repent and to get our hearts right. We read the opening text, but I'll read it again for it's important. The Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said, I've heard your prayer. I've chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. He said, when I shut up the heaven and there's no rain, when I, for effect, command the locusts to devour, to devour the land, or when I send pestilence among my people, if my people who are called by my name, would humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I'll hear from heaven. I'll forgive their sins and I'll heal their land. 
This is one of those if-then principles. God is saying, if you will do this, then I will do this in return. And he's talking to his people, called by his name. I want you to think about this. If there was ever a people called by his name, it's us. We have been baptized in his name, in his blood. We know who he is by the grace of Almighty God. We know that hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. We know that. And, and therefore, in response to that, he said, you must humble yourselves. Humble yourself. Bow down. Present yourself in reverence and fear before God. We need an old-fashioned renewal of humility and of fear of the Lord. Fear of the Lord is, is wisdom. We've got to fear the Lord. Too many are blaspheming the name of the Lord. Too many are cursing God in this day and hour. We need a good old-fashioned humility and fear of the Lord. And he said, and pray. Intercede for yourself. Intercede for your family, for your church, and for your nation. Intercede. We need prayer like never before. Coronation is not just so we can take walks and go for picnics in this beautiful weather. I'm grateful that we're able to do that. But this is the day and hour like never before. We need to be aware we're in a spiritual battle. We need to seek his face, he said, desperately. Desire and crave and demand his presence and turn from our wicked ways. We need to make a, a 180 and get off the, whatever path of evil that we're on. We need to get off of it. He said, and then I will hear from heaven. If you do what I'm asking you to do, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive your sins and then I will heal your land. The Lord has shown us tremendous mercy and he's getting our attention with all the disasters of late. There's been many disasters. We know there's a worldwide financial crisis. There is earthquakes in divers places. There are hurricanes and fires in Australia and on the West Coast and floods and famines and now global pestilence, which was prophesied by the Lord. What will we do with these warnings? Will we say, oh, God, please get rid of this, this coronavirus, this COVID-19. I want to get back to normal. I want to get back to my life. Get rid of this. Or should we sit in solitude and humility as we pray and as we listen for the still, small voice of God? God, what is it that you want to do through me? What do you want to do through this church and through the body of Christ as a whole in this hour? And listen, it's a crucial hour right now. We desperately need an awakening to sweep through the churches so in turn it will sweep through our nation. Without a spiritual awakening, our nation is treading on thin ice. There have been empires older and mightier than the United States that have fallen. And the United States is not immune. It's not immune. So we need to pray and we need an awakening to take place. When the early Puritans and the pilgrims arrived to this, onto this land, they fervently desired to establish America as a godly nation. But within one century after arriving, their passion and their desire for God began to wane. Their children became more concerned with their increasing wealth and with their worldly living rather than furthering the kingdom of God. Doesn't this state sound familiar? But when this happened, God sent men of God who had a strong burden and a passion to be change agents. And the great awakenings of the past were ignited. They started with passionate, 
fervent prayer, deep, heartfelt repentance, sacrifice. We don't like that word anymore, but great sacrifice, anointed and convicting messages. I want to say this right now. It's very hard for me and it's very hard for any minister to stand behind the pulpit and speak a word so directly. It truly is because you know what? Our world wants to hear encouragement only. Just tell me something good. Encourage me. Let me know I'm doing good. Pet my flesh and and give me words of faith. And I love that too. It's easier on the ear. It's easier on the heart. I'm not convicted. I'm not feeling the piercing and the pain of it. But the truth is we need, we need this strong word in this day and hour. But the question is, will we have another great awakening? We need one. Cultural Christianity doesn't have the power to usher in a sovereign move of God for a great awakening. Man-made programs and human talent, he's not interested in that. And entertainment in the church won't do it. We've got to get back to our foundations. The same elements that brought the great awakenings of the past and revival in the past, that spread through colonies like fire, that saw hundreds of thousands converted, that witnessed the miraculous and that changed laws and closed barrooms down. It will do the same today, but we've got to get ourselves back to center, back to the basics. We've got to stop straddling the fence. Charles Spurgeon said this. I didn't write it down. It's not my notes. You don't care because you're not seeing my notes, but I'm going to try this for memory. He said, the reason we are not affecting the world is because the world has had too much effect on the church. God help us. God help us to live godly, separated lives, burdened deep in our hearts for the lost. That doesn't mean we isolate ourselves. It means we separate and we don't blend in. So in closing, our opening scripture in 2 Chronicles chapter 7 was spoken to God's people, not to the world. When we refer to this text, we often refer to the sin in the world, but God was referring to the sin of his people. That's what this scripture is about. If my people, that's what Solomon was saying. He was saying, God, if we uh, serve false, if we uh, serve false gods, if we do this, if we do that, if we do the other. And he said, if I shut up the heavens, if I, if I send pestilence, if I do all these things, if my people who were called by my name would humble themselves, he was not speaking to the Gentiles. Those people served false gods. They did not know God. We know him. We know better. We've read the word. We know what he commands from us. The church has become distracted by the weights and the sin, as Paul said, that so easily besets us. And we've lost sight of the big picture. There is a very big picture. Some have gotten weary in battle, And they've left their post. Because in our distractions, we've forgotten our purpose. We have a purpose. Something is happening because the enemy of our soul is on a war path. And he's taking new territory. And he's ravaging the world as we stand by. As we stand by enjoying our great life with all the blessings from the Lord. He's taking territory. He never sleeps. He's forever taking ground. And the most disheartening part to me is he's ravaging the innocent, those who have no voice. They need our fervent intervention. They need it. So we've been called and chosen to do more than just build the most state-of-the-art buildings. It's awesome if we can, but that's not all we're called to do. It's not about the sound systems we have and the lighting and the large crowds we have or the most talented talented 
musicians and singers, the most creative productions and the coolest graphics and the most awesome websites and marketing strategies. We have been called to be witnesses. And that word encompasses a whole lot more than meets the eye. We are personal witnesses of his saving grace, of his supernatural power and love that brings about restoration. Our world needs to know that. And, and, but we are also called to be witnesses to the lost. And he's given us the power to do so. He said in Acts 1 and 8, you shall be, after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, you shall be witnesses unto me, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. We're in the uttermost parts of the earth. We are to be witnesses. The Lord is going to use this time of chaos to bring about, I promise you, a massive revival because we are surrounded by people that are full of fear and full of anxiety. They're concerned about their health, their family's health. They're concerned about their finances and their mortgages and their debt. They don't know what tomorrow holds. That is why if we get ourselves right and strengthen those tent cords and lengthen the cords, the pegs and the cords, we're gonna have revival. That is why the church must be strong and passionate and take, take advantage of this monumental opportunity we've been given that could quite possibly lead us into the next great awakening. Remember, y'all, this is a spiritual battle we're engaged in and a spiritual battle cannot be won fighting it in the flesh. This is why our prayer must be, oh God, awaken me. I know we don't have an altar to come to. You might be in your car, you might be on the sofa at home, but right now, if you would close your eyes and bow your head. <clears throat> and God, if this word has spoken to the hearts of anyone here, anyone listening within the sound of my voice, I'm asking you, don't let them just push this conviction away. Let them actually do something today. Let them be a change agent, God. Even if they just have to take the first step on getting themselves right first. Pray. Humble themselves first. Pray. Seek his face. Turn from our wicked ways. God is speaking to us. We've got to get right with God. We're living in the last days and you and I have been chosen to usher in the next great awakening. God bless y'all. I can't wait to see you again.